Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening and welcome to our DSBT Wise Habits series. My name is Father Peter Rogers, president of the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. Let us begin with an opening prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. O oh Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us through the hands of Catholic artists who have over the centuries created beautiful and spiritual works of art in the architecture of our churches, in the stained glass windows, in our statues, frescoes, paintings, and all artifacts, especially sacred vessels. Bless all of our current Catholic artists and those who promote Catholic art. We especially ask your blessings on our presenters this evening, who indeed promote all art forms, and on all of us joining this Wise Habits event, that we may all grow in appreciation of religious art and the work of our artists. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. The DSBT Wise Habits series is a chance for us to showcase the fruits of the intellectual formation we offer here at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology in Berkeley. Every friar from our province of the most holy name of Jesus receives his education here at DSBT. These men are pastors in our parishes, they run ministries throughout the province, and they are professors at our school. Our presenter this evening is Father Chris Renz. Father Chris earned his bachelor's degrees from St. Peter's College in New Jersey, a PhD at Northwestern University in Illinois, a master's degree from the Graduate Theological Union here in Berkeley, and a Master of Divinity at DSBT. Father Chris is on the faculty at DSBT and has teaching interests in beauty, creative intuition, and poetry, in religion and spirituality of health studies, in theological ethics of sustainable methods of food production and consumption, and in the subject of tonight's presentation, sacred arts. Father Chris is also director of institutional research overseeing the accreditation process at DSBT and director of the Black Friars Art Gallery at DSBT. Father Chris keeps very busy. The title of tonight's presentation is called Real Religion. Now that's R-E-E-L, Real Religion, the Bible, movies, and the Black Friars movie poster collection. We are very pleased to welcome you, Father Chris, and I now turn the screen over to you and ask you to introduce your guest presenters joining us this evening. Great. Thank you, Father Peter. It's a blessing for me to be here uh, with all of you. And I thank you for joining us. Uh, before I introduce um, our, uh, my two uh, guests uh, for this evening, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background for the collection that we're going to be talking about tonight in particular, but more generally about the Black Friars Gallery and Library. I was thinking in preparing uh, for this evening that maybe we should have uh, suggested that you all get a bowl of fresh popcorn and your favorite <laughs> beverage in a big gulp <laughs> glass <laughs> to join us. Um, so uh, if you don't have that, maybe you can just imagine it <laughs> while you're sitting there. Uh, because our conversation uh, is going to focus on the movie poster collection that we have at Blackfriars Gallery. Um, and you're probably all wondering, well, why would DSBT, which is a Catholic seminary for the formation of uh, Dominican student brothers and uh, lay women and men for ministry in the church, uh, what, why would we have an art collection? Um, well, that's a longer story than we have time for, but briefly, um, one of our faculty, Father Michael Morris, who uh, died uh, from cancer in 2016, was on the faculty here and he was an art historian. His interest um, was in Christian iconography in particular, but he also had a secondary interest in um, uh, religion and cinema. 
He was on the doctoral faculty at GTU for his entire time here. And after his death, uh, he uh, had been running up uh, until that point uh, something called the Santa Fe Institute. And over a 20 plus year period as director of that institute, he had brought together a, a very uh, eclectic <laughs> uh, gathering of art, which I'll mention a little bit towards the end. Um, and uh, some of that, well, all of it was related to these two interests in Christian iconography and uh, cinema and religion. He also developed a library that would support the artwork that he had collected. So we inherited both the art and the library, which are now on the DSBT campus. Um, unfortunately, though, nothing, including the library, was cataloged. So I have spent the last five years trying to do that. And in particular, last year, I've been very uh, uh, excited to be able to work on the movie poster collection. Uh, we had exhibited the collection when Father Michael Morris was alive, and it, in fact, has been exhibited all over the world in various museums in New York, in Australia, in St. Louis, um, and of course, over in San Francisco and at the GTU. We were able to begin this project in the... Um, uh, trying to inventory the uh, biblical mo movie poster collection, thanks to a very generous benefactor who has allowed us to digitize the collection. And then for me to engage two art historians uh, who I'm gonna introduce in just a second. Um, I just wanna mention by way of uh, a little uh, disclaimer as it were. So uh, Father Peter didn't tell you, but my PhD is in virology. Um, <laughs> And so I know nothing about art, histor art history, but I'm learning. And as people have been telling me, well, I have transferable skills. So I've been, I'm learning a lot about this and, and really fascinated by what I'm learning. And a lot of that is, is thanks to the, the two colleagues, I'm happy to say, uh, that I'll introduce to you now. Um, as I mentioned, Father Michael Morris was part of the uh, G2 doctoral faculty and taught many students over the years. And two of those students are here with us tonight, uh, Ryan uh, Parker and Richard Lindsay. Um, I, I, I'll let them tell you precisely when they graduated, but I know it was a while ago, and now they are both professors and uh, they work in different industries. Uh, I am working with them now um, in having them create um, synopses, as it were, of the posters. We have, a, we have 83, professionally framed posters, plus more than 170 other uh, posters that haven't even been uh, looked at yet because they're unframed and they're, they're in boxes. Um, but they've been working through this collection of 83 posters thanks to the fact that they've been digitized by one of our own students who's a professional artist and uh, photographer, Justin Zolli. And it's in the, uh, uh, with that information that I personally have been able to understand uh, much better, not just what the collection is, but why uh, Father Michael Morris would uh, be uh, interested in gathering this together. Um, uh, to say up front, uh, you know, it was not a hobby, it was not simply or merely a hobby of his. As a student at DSPT myself, I always uh, thought about Father Michael Morris in terms of Christian iconography, and that certainly was uh, part of uh, his regular offering of courses here at the DSBT and G the GTU, but he also offered courses in um, uh, religion and cinema, several courses. So I want to turn it over now to uh, Richard and Ryan, Dr. Parker, Dr. Lindsay, and um, begin with a question, just a simple question. After you introduce yourselves, I was wondering if either of you, since in my mind, uh, Father Michael is you know, a Christian iconography person, um, I'm wondering if either of you ever took um, the Christian iconography course, and and if so, uh, how, in your experience, uh, does that relate to um, his interest in cinema and and the biblical movie poster collection? Yeah, I guess I can start because I actually took that Christian iconography class. Um, so it's it's great to be here with you all. And um, as Chris said, I was a student of. Father Michaels and my focus for my dissertation was on contemporary Christian cinema and kind of the study, my, my whole focus of my studies while the GTU was basically the history of 
religious cinema, and I couldn't have asked for a better advisor uh, because Michael realized that Father Michael realized that cinema itself did not emerge uh, from nothing, right, or, or or exist in a vacuum. That especially religious cinema had this long, rich history of um, of iconography and. Uh, the intersection of religion and the arts. So he would often joke in our iconography class that he could tell the history of art from the dawn of human civilization, uh, but he would cut it off at like 1900 or 1905, uh, the visual arts that is, and then switch over to cinema because for him that had become the dominant and would remain the dominant art form around the world for, you know, like we're still in the midst of it in a way. So uh, it was it was fantastic to have that kind of background uh, before going on to take the religion and the cinema course, which I know both Richard and I took, and I think we may have taken it together. Um, so Richard, I don't know if you want to say a word about that class. Uh, yeah, my name is Richard Lindsay, and uh, I also um, uh, work with um, uh, Father Michael Morris as my advisor in my PhD program. Uh, I was studying religion, media, and, and culture, and uh, did my dissertation specifically on biblical epic films. And uh, this was uh, uh, 2012 that I graduated and Ryan graduated the year before me. And um, I guess I would say in terms of the religion and the cinema course, really um, uh, what Father Michael would do would really give us a whole history of, um, of cinema through the eyes of religious film. And uh, he would, and then we would watch a film together as a class and discuss it. Uh, and it was really a, it was really a, you know, just an incredible, um, an incredible experience. And we were able to learn so much uh, context from him before we would go about watching the films. Um, the, the tools that he used to teach were these posters. Uh, the posters were basically, you know, this was a time he started teaching this course probably in the 80s, I think, 80s and 90s. This was not a time where you could just simply Google everything and find everything. Uh, you had to, he had to, you know, find the posters himself, uh, purchase the posters, purchase the movie stills. Um, these were all sort of the tools of his trade and the tools of his teaching as he was, he was teaching us about these films. And so really we were talking about iconography um, the, the posters have their own iconography. They have their own sort of message that uh, points to something else. In this case, you know, a lot of times it's just simply pointing to the film and trying to point the uh, audience member into the film to go pay the, pay, pay, uh, the box office to get in. But um, they tell a story and uh, each of these, these posters is sort of like a key to a doorway. Uh, that tells a whole panoply of stories about religion and film and the relationship uh, of society to all of those things. Uh, so what I wanted to do is uh, just start by showing you a couple of posters from the collection. And, uh, and Ryan and I are going to tell you just a couple of the stories that go along with these posters. Um, so what I'm going to, I'll start with uh, this one right here. And oops, we've got to go backwards. <clears throat> now this looks like a, a, a little bit of a Sunday school image uh, here. This doesn't look like the kind of spectacular movie posters that we're used to, but this was for a film that was made in 1898. Uh, and it says the passion play of Omer Amer Amergau. If you're familiar with art history, you may know, or religious drama, uh, the passion play of Ober Amergau is put on every 10 years in a town in Germany. And it's been, going on since I don't know which century, but it was basically put on uh, as a celebration for, to, to God for saving the town from the plague. So it goes back a long way. Um, the uh, producer of this film, Richard B. Holland, uh, said that you know, he sort of promoted this very, very early silent film made in, you know, before the 20th century as uh, a play that was depicting the passion play of Omer Amergau. But in fact, he filmed it on top of a hotel in New York City. Uh, using sets and actors. And so we have an early instance of movie magic taking us to a different world. What was interesting, uh, one of the interesting things about this particular poster is its size. And uh, the size was um, uh, 41 inches by 27 inches, which turned out to be basically, it became the standard size for movie posters. Uh, what's called the one sheet movie poster that's used 
uh, to this day, when you walk into a theater and you see a poster, it's usually a 41 by 27. So in some ways, this is the first movie poster uh, that was ever made. And interesting that it happened to be a passion play that was the topic. One of the uh, poor, poor Mr. Holland had a very hard time with though uh, was um, that Thomas Edison uh, was the inventor, at least of the American version of the movie camera. And he believed that anybody who made a film using his camera owed him a royalty or the copyright to the film. And he was very insistent upon this. He would sue people. He would send uh, what he called patent detectives, which were really thugs, to go take people's films from them if they didn't give him the royalty he felt he deserved. So uh, just a year or so later, uh, this passion play came out and it was rebranded as Edison's copyrighted production of the passion play. He simply, he sued Holland in court and he simply took this version of the passion play uh, as his own, copyrighted it as his own. Now, the reason, uh, one of the reasons that this is historically interesting is that um, it was because of this that, um, that film producers who had been based on the East Coast, places like New York City and in New Jersey, decided that they needed to get away from Edison and his patent attorneys and patent enforcers. And so they moved west and uh, they moved to and set up what they called a film colony in Hollywood. And that was the beginnings of Hollywood. It was basically to get away from Edison and his patent trust uh, that were keeping them from having the freedom to make their own films. Uh, so here we see just with these two posters, that are uh, just about, you know, seem to be about these, this sort of very pious religious story on film, uh, the beginnings of the history of American filmmaking. Uh, I, I appreciate you saying that, Richard, and I, I appreciate you giving the nod to the, um, the gangster beginnings of Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's not all as, as creative as, as people, people sometimes think it is. Uh, so Richard is sharing a, a poster, really a lobby card, uh, which would have been another form of advertising a film that would have been, that would have decorated the lobbies of these elaborate movie palaces, um, especially in the like 20s, 30s and, and 40s. We don't see many of these today, but this is from the 1925 version of Ben-Hur, which was directed by Fred Niblo and, uh, what I really appreciate about what Richard has said around the passion play is you can tell the history of American cinema basically through religious films. So at every key moment in the history of cinema, where whether it's you know the earliest days uh, on the East Coast or the founding of Hollywood on the West Coast, the advent of sound, of um, color, of technicolor, uh, of kind of the, the cinemascope, the big widescreen, uh, exhibitions or uh, presentations that we now take for granted, there, there seems to always be a religious film at, at the intersection there at that moment. And, and Ben-Hur was one of those films uh, throughout many generations. So you have this version in 1925, which is a black and white film, and the lobby card advertises what is kind of the reason people went to see this film, right? The spectacle of the chariot race. Most people listening to this have no doubt seen uh, the 1959, 1959 version with Charlton Heston. Uh, but, but here again, you have maybe a proto blockbuster. I don't think we really can start using the term blockbuster until maybe the 70s or 80s, even though this, this genre that we talk about, the kind of the sword and sandal genre, the Ten Commandments, which we'll talk about later, Ben Hur, for example. Uh, these to us are now blockbusters, but they wouldn't necessarily have been thought about thought of that then. Uh, but but nonetheless, you have you have this poster. So again, a key moment in in the history of film. Richard, you want to skip to the next, uh, unless you have anything to add. But uh, so we're <laughs> but this is where it gets really fun. So when uh, when we look at the history of religious cinema. One of the things that is often advertised as much as its non-religious counterparts is sensuality, sexuality, violence, and as I said with Ben-Hur, spectacle. And if you take a close look at this collection, we're really spoiled for choice when it comes down to uh, themes of sexuality and sensuality. 
being kind of given pride of place in this advertising. So this is from a film uh, called The Prodigal, uh, or as you see here in the French translation, The Prodigal Son, uh, in 1955, directed by Richard Thorpe and starring who was at that time a major star, Lana Turner. Um, but you can see it's on it's on full display here about you know what the filmmakers were promising potential moviegoers that they would see if they came in. Now most of these films, whether it's you know Samson and Delilah or Solomon and Sheba or this film The Prodigal, we look at them today and it's all rather tame by comparison to what we see even on television today. But at the time it was it was enticing, it was titillating to uh, to potential moviegoers, and so. Uh, Father Michael used to say in class all the time, you could look back through the history of American cinema and see who America's enemies were uh, by who the bad guys were in, in, the, in the films, the nationality of the villains in the films. And he said, in some cases, you could also see the weapons that we would fight those enemies with because he would compare uh, Lana Turner's bra in this poster to nuclear warheads. So... Uh, again, as Richard said, a window, a door into a time and a place. If this is 1955, um, you know, not not terribly long, right after World War II, uh, and and so a, a, a generation, a time in which this is this is signaling, uh, you know, certain making certain promises to potential viewers that the films may or may not ultimately deliver on. So. And uh, so um, as, as Ryan was talking about in terms of like the, the, the enemies of the country and understanding the relationship uh, of the United States to the rest of the world, um, one of the best examples of that is the Ten Commandments um, from 1956 uh, by uh, Cecil B. DeMille. Cecil B. DeMille uh, became, he really became, his name became synonymous with the epic. And in fact, this was the second Ten Commandments film that he made because he also made a silent version in 1923. Um, this film is all about the Cold War, and it's all about DeMille's understanding that, uh, that, that the Ten Commandments were, in fact, the basis of freedom uh, um, and of democracy in the United States. And um, so, you know, he's not talking about freedom in a sense that, that it became known like in the 60s of kind of, of you know, uh, libertinism, but freedom under the law. And uh, so what you see here is... Um, is you have Moses up front as the lawgiver, and uh, and he's got the law, you know, on the Ten Commandments there that he's he's ready to give uh, to uh, to the people. In the background, you have Ramses, who is the representative of a kind of totalitarian state, which keeps people from having freedom. And um, the Egyptians in this film are very much, you know, meant to be the Soviet Union and the communists. Um, in the background, you see the the uh, the people of uh, Israel that are fleeing um, and that are the Exodus story, and then you also see Moses uh, parting the Red Sea, and so that shows that sort of God is on the side of the the these you know these these people who are meant to be sort of the beginners and the bringers of freedom. One of the interesting little details here is that you can see an eagle in silhouette just below the um just below the 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 ten commandments um stones there and so that gives you uh, that gives you an indication right away about what we're talking about here this is a nationalist story uh, a sort of american nationalist story so he's taking the charter story of the hebrew people and superimposing it as a charter story of american democracy one of the interesting things about this was that uh one of the ways that he started promoting the film uh, was by working with a, uh, a, a fraternal organization called the Fraternal Order of Eagles that started putting up monuments to the Ten Commandments in places like courthouses, schools, public parks. And DeMille would send people you know, from the film. They would send Charlton Heston or they'd send Yul Brynner to these dedications of, of these Ten Commandments monuments. So now, at this point, uh, we have conflict over separation of church and state. And uh, so there will be conflicts over monuments of the Ten Commandments in public parks. But this all started with the promotion of the Ten Commandments film. So in some ways, what we're arguing about is actually 
the longest PR campaign for a film in the history of the world. And it's still going on to this day. So, uh, you know, this is just some of the story and some of the background that you get when you begin looking uh, at these posters more closely. And what's important to understand about what, um, about what, what Father Michael was doing was, you know, he wasn't just randomly collecting these posters. He was, he was carefully curating the posters that he found because of the story that they told either about film history or about religion or about religious history. And uh, that was, you know, uh, again, you know, using these as tools in his classes, um, that was really kind of what the, the iconography of these posters represented. Yeah, and I would add too, Richard, in, in the ways in which you talk about the Ten Commandments and kind of nationalism and, and politics, what have you, for the most part, most of the films that are advertised in this collection have comparatively very little to do with teaching us anything about scripture or uh, faithfulness to it, right? I mean, you look at something like The Prodigal, that's a 90 minute movie for a five minute story. I mean, is that how, how long would it take you to read The Prodigal Son? So you think about what has to go into that, right? The creative license that is, at, that is necessary. Uh, and the same thing with The Ten Commandments. I mean, how long would it take to tell that story as, as we have it in scripture. And so uh, recognizing that the license that's taken is telling us something about the time and the place at which, in which these films were made also. One of the things I wanted to add to that though was that, that whether or not these things are scripturally correct, um, I think some of the value that, that Father Michael saw in, in film um, had to do with the sense of spectacle. And that, um, you know, he, he often would describe uh, the experience of going into a movie theater, uh, particularly in, in the older, you know, movie palaces. And we're very lucky here in the Bay Area that many of these, several of these movie palaces have been preserved. And so you can go check them out. You know, you can go to the Grand Lake in, in Oakland or to the Castro in, uh, in San Francisco and experience what it was like to walk into a movie palace to have that sense of awe as you as you kind of walk into this very temple-like building, and see uh, this you know fantastic play uh, being played out on the screen, and he often made some comparisons between that and say uh, the spectacle of of the mass or uh, the spectacle of of um, church ritual, and uh, it wasn't because he was saying you know they're the same thing. Uh, you know he certainly saw church ritual as being, uh, as being sacred, but um, that, that kind of everyday experience of going into the movies and just kind of being humbled and, uh, and in awe of what you see um, was also part of his spirituality. And that it, it points you in another direction. It points you towards something greater than yourself. And I think that that was why Ryan and I, despite coming from very different backgrounds from Father Michael, uh, coming from our sort of Protestant denominational backgrounds um, really yeah. resonated with him because we were looking for those answers as to uh, how religion um, and, and how religious, uh, you know, religion sort of intersects with the culture. We talked about the, the uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a, a total coincidence that you have the rise of the megaplex as you have the rise of the mega church and yeah. the attendant kind of architectural wasteland that both of those are compared to these, the cathedrals and the palaces that Richard talked about just a second ago. Right. I really appreciate um, what each of you have been saying here, especially because it's helping me um, understand uh, in, in a deeper way the intentionality of what Father Michael was doing with uh, collect curating this, uh, this genre um, and its relationship to, the, if I can put it in this way, the, 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 the experience of icons. You know, you have religious icons and they open up a, a doorway or a window or, or a portal to uh, the divine, something bigger. Um, but in their own way, as, as you both have been pointing out, so too do these posters um, give you um, 
a portal into um, the, uh, the, the progression of what's going on in, in our case in, in, in um, culture in the United States. So it's very fascinating. And I'm thinking, you know, in that regard, maybe in the last couple of minutes, based on your own um, experience of what Father Michael Morris was doing, and then your expertise in the area of religion and cinema, um, why, why ought DSPT to uh, uh, keep and maintain this collection? What's, the, what's not just, I don't mean monetary value, but what's the value for us, knowing what we're trying to do of, of maintaining this collection, making it available for teaching and research? Uh, I would say the biggest value is so Ryan and I can look at them whenever we want. <laughs> yes. um, I think that's a big part of it. Um, <laughs> I would say also that, you know, this is, you know, like we said, this is, this is important for the sake of preserving film history. And I don't know of any other institution that would be able to preserve this kind of material um, with this particular focus. Um, so, you know, the places that this has been sent around to are places like St. Louis University um, and, uh, you know, which is a, a Jesuit school and places like um, the, unfortunately, the now closed Museum of, of Biblical Art. And um, so, you know, this, this has a particular focus that I have never seen anywhere else in any kind of um, exhibits or exhibition or or body of, of of film memorabilia. So, if nothing else, this is unique in terms of of um, what you're able to do with it and what you're able to show. It's certainly a one of a kind collection, and it, you you can't put a, a value on it in terms of uh, like you've already said, ignoring the monetary side of it. I mean, I, I think it's impossible. Um, but there's also something that, that we've kind of hinted at that Father Michael was doing in collecting this. It's almost like giving it this deeper value, right, of instilling it with this kind of more sacred tone or this sacred identity. And, and continuing in that work validates that choice. I mean, it validates that, that meaning that's been placed on this. I mean, we've already said how, how they are these windows into the past and, and where we've been and who we are. And, and, um, but there's something about the act of caring for this that also says something about what we value, what, what we mean when we say that the intersection of art and religion, that art can be a, a site for the sacred and these kind of transcendent experiences. So, right. Yeah, again, I think that's really important that, you know, um, while there certainly is the, the genre of sacred art and, and the genre of religious art, um, there, are, there, are, there are, if I can put it this way, secular ways of accessing the divine and, and truly beautiful art in doesn't necessarily have to be religious can provide that transcendent experience. Natural beauty can provide that transcendent experience and to have a collection like this I think um, one would, I would hope, you know, can be inspirational for um, um, not just Catholic uh, Christian artists, but artists in general to, to recognize the value of pointing um, to the transcendent, to the divine. Um, I wanted to just ask you to maybe talk for a minute or so about um, some of the educational endeavors you hope to do with this project. So I've, I've got you on a, one of those projects right now, which is you're writing um, short summaries of each of the 83 frame posters, but I know you guys have other ideas. So if you wanna just mention quickly what some of those ideas are. Yeah, I think uh, one is, is uh, hopefully cataloging these in such a way that we can resume sharing it with other locations. I think first and foremost is if you want to share this and I can already tell you, um, I've had a conversation, I've had a couple of conversations with folks at seminaries across the country and they are immediately intrigued by what, what you have here and the sense of, uh, wanting to, to show it, uh, wanting to showcase it and, and they immediately get it right. They immediately get why this is important and why it would fit in their library, for example, or if they have a gallery where they could, where they could show it. So, uh, yeah, other than potentially writing a, a catalog to go with that uh, beyond the work that we're currently doing, 
Uh, and then also, Richard, I don't know if you want to say anything about the podcast, but uh, as you can see from, I mean, we could go, uh, you know, lucky for you, we only have a short amount of time, but, you know, Richard and I could go on and on and on about these posters and this genre. And um, just with the rise of podcasts over the last several years as a, as a medium for storytelling, for education, uh, as a companion resource to something like this, we've talked a bit about uh, having a podcast series inspired by this, maybe devoted to this, Richard, I don't know if you want to say a word or two about that. Yeah. So uh, in talking about that, what we're trying to do is, is in, in creating something that's recorded, something that is um, could be released as a, as a podcast series that would talk about uh, the, the posters and the films. Um, this could also uh, be useful in terms of if we're sending out the posters as uh, part of an exhibit um, and in providing information for people, you know, that they could listen to as they're going around and looking at the posters. And uh, the idea is to try to capture some of the magic as best we can, because we can never do it like him, but uh, some of the magic of, of uh, Father Michael's teaching that went along with the posters. Because it's one thing to just have the posters and have them up there and, and you know, you look at them and go, oh, this is really interesting. But unless you know the background, unless you can, you know, turn the key to that portal um, and know the stories that go along with them, um, then it's not, it's not nearly as interesting. So um, what we're hoping to do is to put together the sponsorship that we would be able to um, have some kind of multimedia way of accessing these and what's, you know, a way that is, is very current and that really is getting people very excited these days would be something like a podcast or a, a recording of some kind. Great. And if you, uh, you who are listening out there, if you, if you never met Father Michael Morris or never uh, saw him engage with these movie posters, um, Clay's put links on in the chat box to our website where, and if you go to the, um, the specific uh, page that has the biblical movie poster collection, you'll see a, um, an interview that was done um, of, uh, with Father Michael Morris uh, on PBS when the collection was in St. Louis. And that will really give you a snapshot of um, both his personality and his interest in and excitement for this particular collection. Um, so I'd, I'd like to end here and uh, thank um, Ryan and Richard for, for their time here. Um, and also um, to uh, mention to all of you, uh, we are uh, looking um, in the next year uh, to get the collection ready uh, to go out on exhibition. So we're looking to find places that might be appropriate for this collection. So if you happen to know of any place, um, a museum or a university gallery, uh, I would certainly be interested in, in if you have any contacts and knowing that. Um, we're also obviously needing uh, some uh, financial support to continue our preservation project and to help uh, put forward some of these educational ideas that we have. Uh, after all, the whole purpose of keeping a collection of art is for education and research. Um, so I think, Clay, um, if there are any questions, we can open it up now for we have some time for questions and uh, general conversation. I think yes, there's a good question in the has, chat. Yes. So, uh, and if anyone else has any questions, they can leave them in the chat. I'll, I'll read them. So we have one question from Father Peter. De, uh, DeMille used religious themes to promote his nationalistic theme. He was hugely, hugely successful. Can that still happen today? Or do filmmakers have to stay away from religious uh, themes to promote societal stories? Or is that era gone? You want me to get that one? Anyone... <laughs> I've got ideas. Go ahead. It seems like you're ready to say something. Uh, so I, I would say it, it's certainly not impossible. Um, I think that it takes somebody who's willing to do a kind of a passion project um, uh, not to, I mean, uh, that's kind of a pun. Is that because, pun intended? Uh, Is that pun because, intended? Um, you certainly had that with, um, you certainly had that with Mel Gibson's uh, Passion of the Christ in 2004, there were definitely political themes that were a part of that, um, that had to do um, kind of with culture wars in the United States. Um, so, you know, I, I think that it could still be done. I think that 
there are lots of ways that filmmakers can make money these days and can earn, can uh, generate money to, um, to put films out there. Um, but uh, can it be done through the studio system? Uh, that's kind of a question and that's something Ryan might know more about. I think it's harder. I mean, it was hard for DeMille to do what he did. I mean, it, after even as successful as he was, you know, we joked about, uh, I think it was Solomon and Sheba. You know, the, the studio wouldn't green light that project until uh, one day he walked in and showed sketchings of sketches of a scantily clad Sheba and said, this is what it's going to look like. And he said, well, how much money do you need? Uh, it's so, I, and I think there's some, I think there's a still a bit of that cynicism today. Uh, who, who is behind it, right? How much money can those people bring to the table? I mean, I, I think there's some of the more successful versions of religious cinema have been, that have, I think, cultural messages to them, if you will, uh, maybe not necessarily nationalistic, um, have, have been independently produced, but distributed by studios. So it's been, it's been more of a, of a partnership where the studios don't invest in the production of that film necessarily, but yet they still take a fairly good cut of, of the receipts uh, if it does well, um, or regardless, they take their share. So, uh, but at that level, I don't, I would be very surprised to see something like that at work. Do we have other questions? Yes, we just got one now. This is from Mark. Is the genre of film posters still viable to tell such wonderful stories now that most films are streamed or dramatized into a series? Uh, fabulous presentation and great to see some familiar faces. Hey, Mark. <laughs> uh, Ryan, yeah, I think you might know more about that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's still... I, you know, a lot of these are used digitally now um, and the streamers are stretched so thin, at, you know, you, you talked about streaming and series. I mean, I, I have a poster that I saw recently that I loved uh, for a series called Midnight Mass on Netflix, which I highly recommend, but it was a really, really cool poster um, that had a, had a kind of a 70s and 80s aesthetic to it. So yeah, they're they're very much uh, still a thing. I, you know, a lot of them have been cropped to fit your uh, social media feed, uh, but they are still still at, at play. And there are one of the things that we're learning as we go. There are folks who have made careers designing these posters. A lot of them are kind of live in anonymity, you know, but a few have cut through. Um, and you know, you have to kind of look for that signature if it's even there. And that, that's a whole separate process and decision-making decision process that I've not necessarily been directly involved in, but maybe one or two degrees away. But, but yes, it's still a part of the whole process. Looks like we have another question there. Um, you, yes. you want to go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so um, as streaming services take over for traditional fr film studios and TikTok or quantum holograms become the, the art forms of the future, how do you see the narratives of religion and art changing? Uh, Ryan, do you wanna get that one? Yeah, I, you know, it's, I think it would be more, I don't know that necessarily the ways in which s cinematic stories are televised or serializations are told affects the way that religion and art functions, right? I think the changing ways of religion and art or religion and art changing may just have to do with the larger cultural climate of our experience of religion are fleeing from it or changing uh, affiliations with it, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking about a, plat a platform that kind of came and went that was, uh, if any of you heard of Quibi, which was the biggest waste of a couple billion dollars that you've, you've ever seen. Uh, and they were trying to change viewing habits um, and it was just never gonna work. Um, I, 
maybe it has to do with attention spans, right? Our ability to kind of give our, can we give ourselves over at length to these experiences? Maybe. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, that's a roundabout way of If I could say uh, that question. Like one thing I've noticed about this is because there are so many streams and so many platforms at this point, um, there are a lot of stories that can get told that, uh, that are more, more niche stories. So, I mean, there's something like Midnight, Midnight Mass, you know, would that have been greenlighted to be told on uh, one of the three broadcast networks 25 years ago? Probably not. Um, and so that's something that dealt very deeply, you know, with some very deep issues of, of theology and spirituality in a very serious way. So there, are, there is some good news in that sense and that the diversification of channels and the diversification of platforms for this stuff means that it, it tends to be marketed a little bit more towards um, you know, a segmented audience. So it's not like you have to release uh, you know, the 10 commandments and it has to appeal to everybody um, to, to get everybody to go out to the theater. So I would say that's, I would say that's one plus of, of the streaming platform. And I would dig even a little bit deeper on that. It, it's a great point, Richard, that you make about Midnight Mass, but I would add that Mike Flanagan doesn't even get that greenlit unless he's had the successes of The Haunting of Hill House, The Haunting of Bly Manor, which were both massive hits for Netflix, and then off the heels of a rather successful low-budget indie feature called Hush uh, many years ago. So even then, it's, uh, it's about what kind of track record does that potential storyteller have if a studio is going to come alongside, right, and invest in the production of it. You know, for me, the, the, as I was studying contemporary independent Christian filmmakers, uh, on the Protestant side, I, it, it, you know, the most successful people there had resources behind them. Uh, to at least make the thing that they wanted to make. Mm -hmm. And this is the challenge that I think a lot of religious, specifically religious filmmakers are facing right now, is they're probably not going to get support from an established network to start, right? Or a streamer or a studio, what have you. They need benefactors. And, you know, I can understand why places would not want to invest in that. Communities would not want to invest in that. I mean, we're the, the challenges that face us seem far bigger than investing in a film, you know, but we've always had those challenges and yet people of faith have invested and faith communities have invested in the arts for centuries. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, we have another uh, question this is from Catherine Barush. I have a lot of students interested in studying material culture and any mention of the film posters always seems to generate interest. As cinema scholars, could you perhaps mention some thesis or research topics that might be pursued through a close? Be pursued, what was the last part of that, Clay? She's... Um, be pursued uh, through, where did it go? Um, a, a close study. Um, Sorry, just hold on a second here. Uh, through a close study of the posters. So um, research topics that might be uh, forthcoming from the poster collection. Mm -hmm. uh, just about anything uh, having to do with uh, <laughs> society, <laughs> culture. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you could look at race relations. Uh, you could look at the way people of different races are treated in these posters and in the films. Um, again, I think the posters have to kind of lead you in that direction towards taking a look at some of the films and what and what they did. Certainly gender, uh, um, things like gender, uh, gender identity, sexuality, um, uh, you know, like we talked about some of the some of the um, questions about, you know, who are America's enemies and 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 how is America going to fight? Uh, that kind of thing can be in these posters. Um, certainly a lot of, of history, you know, along with those material, that material culture, there's a lot of history of, in, of the industry that goes along with that. And that's one of the fascinating things about this. I mean, the joke that Michael used to make about, you know, uh, the films being made for what was at one time considered a largely Protestant country, um, which were being produced by Jewish producers and were being censored by Catholics. 
Um, so, um, you know, that kind of thing, uh, you know, you can find out about all kinds of things like that once you kind of dive into the history that goes along with the, um, that goes along with the posters. I mean, another way might be another potential avenue of study might be the ways in which these posters are uh, examples or mirror other entries in the genre that may not be specifically religious, for example. So I think about like the sword and sandal epic. I mean, obviously you had tons of blockbuster, you know, blockbuster films that the aesthetic of those posters mirrors the non-religious posters of the day. Uh, and then you start to look at kind of art house films of the seventies, late sixties and early seventies. And you can really see commonalities, aesthetic commonalities between the religious posters and their kind of secular mainstream counterparts, if you will. Another question from uh, Mark Melenia. Uh, in Father Michael Morris's assessment, what is the connection between iconography and the poster uh, posters or movies? How can a visual representation representation of religious art affect the moving? Uh, Ryan, did you want to? Um, let, I'm just, I'm rereading the question, mm -hmm. um, between iconography and the poster. Well, I would say the posters first off is as Richard mentioned earlier, the fact that it's pointing to something else, pointing to something, drawing your attention to something, trying to lure you in into a, into an experience. Um, much the same way that icons might have in a more specifically religious setting. Um, the films themselves, I think we've already talked about how that's just a, a bit more complicated. Um, you know, I was critical of these films or commented that these films had little to do with scripture. Um, that did not stop people from having deeply spiritual experiences through those films. So you can find uh, letters to the editor. Uh, if you go to, for example, at the Margaret Herrick Library here in Los Angeles, there's a wealth of information uh, that you can find on people's responses to these films. And they were deeply spiritual experiences for a lot of people. Um, again, much the same way of sitting in a cathedral and looking at, at art. And there may have been direct comparisons to those by, by viewers. Um, the visual representation of religious art affect the moving screen and vice versa. What do you think, Richard? So I think, I think there definitely was uh, an, an there definitely were, were parallels that were made. A lot of times um, it had to do with symbolism. And so you certainly had similar kinds of symbolism um, that you might have in iconography or at least in, in religious art as a whole um, that would be used in the films. So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's very hard to think about say the Last Supper uh, and not think of everybody sitting on one side of the table. You know, so then when they came out with, uh, when they did um, The Greatest Story Ever Told in uh, what was this, 1966 or something like that, uh, they, of course, uh, that one of the things they were trying to promote was their, uh, was their Cinerama, which is this massive widescreen format. And so, of course, they had the, the, the Last Supper happening where everybody's sitting on one side of the table uh, because, um, you know, a lot of times they, the filmmakers will evoke famous art, uh, famous religious art in order to, to you know, have that spark of recognition uh, in the moviegoers when they actually see the film. So there were, I think there were a lot of parallels sometimes. And Father Michael was really good at like, let's say looking at a poster or something like that and saying, oh, well, they clearly have just copied the head of Christ by this particular artist in the 16th century or whatever. <laughs> I don't know if Ryan and I are, nearly as knowledgeable to be able to do that. No, it took, it, took my, it took my brain a second to get going, but you're exactly right, Richard. I mean, we would be in class watching a film yeah. as a group and, and with Father Michael, and he would point to, he would pause, sometimes pause, and then point to a painting or a sculpture or whatever. And he was so big on, and Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's Tiso's Bible, yes. right? With illustrations by Anne Catherine Emmerich. 
Yes. Who it's it's and the history of religious cinema is you cannot separate it from that book. You cannot overstate how influential that that version of the Bible, the images in that Bible were on that history, even up to Gibson's The Passion of the Christ in 2004. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So we have a question from Revel 4. I'm not sure what the question is. If you could rephrase that, I appreciate it. Uh, in the meantime, I have uh, one question. And I apologize if I'm having um, connection issues. Um, you mentioned the, the power of the spectacle of going to these movie palaces. Uh, I think of uh, the attempt to overwhelm the audience in movies, in Michael Bay films, for example. Maybe that's, that's just a gratuitous example. Um, where the, the, uh, it's, supposed, it's trying to evoke a sense of awe. Um, however, I see many people uh, saying that, that Michael Bay films are nauseating, visually nauseating. So how would you say uh, in the modern era where we have computer uh, generated uh, images, you know, for films and things, what is the uh, way forward? Or what do you think is the golden mean for uh, invoking awe without being not? <laughs> that is, that's a great question. That's a research project right there, I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's really, it's, it's really interesting because with, with the rise of streamers um, uh, and, and what it seems to be, and especially hastened by the pandemic, the only, it's going to be really hard to say this because I'm going tonight to see Dune on the big screen, even though it's on my television at home, because I want that feeling right now. Hopefully it won't be nauseating, uh, but I know what you mean. The only options you will have, or 99% of the options that you will have if you go to your local theater will be those big epic blockbusters. Uh, and it's an attempt to sell that experience that you're talking about. Some filmmakers do it better than others. But the idea of going to see a film, I'm trying to think, oh, The Last Duel, which came out this, this last weekend, but also a kind of an epic film with big battle scenes and, and what have you. But, the, but like intimate dramas, right? This, you're probably not going to go to the theater to see that anymore because you can watch it on your television at home. So filmmakers, I think a filmmaker like uh, Dennis Villeneuve, who is doing Dune, I think has can do a good job of that. Um, I think about uh, a filmmaker like Terrence Malick, who trades in that experience of the spiritual. It may not be, and I think it's completely the other side of nauseating, right? Some people find it just too, too indulgent. Uh, many mainstream viewers may find that too indulgent. I, I don't. I, I think it's extremely transcendent. Um, yeah, Richard, I don't know if you have thoughts about or examples of, of big yeah, films uh, done I mean, well. One of, the, one of the things that comes to mind is Paul Schrader and his idea of transcendental cinema and, um, and that, that cinema that is actually transcendent is actually less, not more. And so, so you have very, um, and he's going on, you know, he was looking at people like, um, oh, I can't remember the, the, the directors he, he was looking at, but it was basically uh, the main film, one of the main films he would look at was the, um, the um, Passion of St. Joan of Arc, which is this incredibly spare, minimalist, very close up focus on Joan of Arc as she's going through um, this, this trial. And this is silent, you know, this is a silent film, um, but, um, yeah, I, I think you're right in that in that more does not necessarily equal that sense of awe and that sense of of being uplifted. Sometimes it's less, and uh, it's a good director that can figure out what what the line is there. And yeah. most of them have forgotten that, and they're not even interested in it. Uh, they're interested in basically making video games that act out on screen. So, <laughs> and it's just going to be harder and harder to get to that type of film. Yeah. Definitely. in that kind of experience, right? Uh, to kind of let it wash over you, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, as, as Ryan predicted earlier, if we unleashed the two of you, <laughs> you could go on all night long. <laughs> so it's very interesting um, to, to hear these kind of uh, uh, free-flowing ideas. And 
you know, as as an outsider to the the not just the genre but the uh, academic discipline, I think one of the things that I find fascinating about um, this uh, bridge, if you will, between a, a particularly religious uh, form of iconography, Christian iconography, Catholic Christian iconography, and secular iconography, if you will, is the anthropology that's behind it all. That is human beings. You know, we have a certain need, desire, propensity for certain kinds of uh, ways of experiencing the world, symbolic. You know, you, you mentioned that, Richard, um, the need for awe, not just the desire for awe, but the need for awe. Um, and there's, there's some very fundamental uh, philosophical anthropology reasons for that. There's some studies that are being conducted now in cognitive science that are looking at uh, the, 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 the desire for awe and its effects on us. So my point being, there, there are these huge anthropological implications that, again, sort of set what Father Michael Morris was doing in a very uh, reasonable, and if not actually critical, um, element of what we're trying to do here at the school. Um, so it's just uh, 6.30 now, so I want to again thank the two of you for your time this evening. I know you're both really, really busy, um, so I appreciate the effort. And um, let's just uh, close with a, a quick prayer. Loving creator, you who have made all things in your love for the world and have made us in your own image and likeness, we ask that you continue to bless us, uh, bless our creativity, bless our desire for natural beauty so that in turn it might lead to a desire for you and bless all those who support uh, us in our respective ministries and uh, what we do at the DSPT. Amen. So thank you, everyone. It's great to uh, be with you virtually, and uh, we hope to uh, do more of this in the future. So bless you and wish you all a good evening. Thanks.